Hello everyone, my name is Jason Gregerson. In this video, we're going to talk about the characterization of invertible matrices. We're going to start out with a statement. Let T of X be the transformation represented by multiplication by the matrix A, where A is an N by N invertible matrix. So that inverse does exist. And we're going to generate a series of statements that this statement is going to imply. Or in other words, if this matrix is invertible, then all the following things will be true. So we'll start off with the first one. We're going to be able to say that there is at least one solution to the matrix equation AX equals B for every B in RN. And so that's a pretty strong straight statement. Why can we make that statement? Well, if A is invertible, I can find this inverse matrix, in which case I could take my equation AX equals B and simply multiply both sides on the left by A inverse. Now on the left side of this equation, this product will be identity and identity times x is just the x vector. On the right-hand side, I'm left with this product. And this is my solution to the matrix equation. And since this is invertible, I can always find an inverse. And no matter what b is, I can just do this matrix multiplication. So there's always at least one solution to this equation. But this statement that there's at least one solution to ax equals b for every b in Rn is just the definition of onto. So now we know this transformation is onto. And since we've worked with that definition of onto before, there's a lot of other things we can also say. For instance, we can say that the columns of A span Rn. And of course, that comes from the fact that if we have a solution, we always have a solution to this for any B in Rn. And this matrix multiplication can really be thought of as taking a linear combination of the columns. So this could be x1 times the first column plus x2 times the second column, so on and so forth to xn times the last nth column. Since we can always find x1, x2, so on and so forth, where this linear combination gives us to b, that's the same thing as saying that b is in the span of the columns of a. And since this is true for any b in Rn, then the columns of a span Rn. Now what else does this mean? Well, this also tells us that we want to first maybe start with our matrix and try to find out if the matrix is onto, one thing we could look at is the pivot positions. So the fact that the matrix is onto also tells us that, that there is a pivot position in every row of A. And so what's another way we can see this? Well, let's start looking at a small matrix, a small augmented matrix. If I start to write this matrix A out, a potential matrix A, and notice I'm not going to make it n by n in this case to demonstrate this example. If I had a matrix that looked like this, then there wouldn't always be a solution. For instance, if I chose some B that looked like 1, 1, for instance, this last row would tell me that 0 equals 1, which is not a true statement. So there wouldn't be a solution in this case. However, as long as there is a pivot position here as well, then I should be able to write an expression for a solution, no matter what B is, whether it's 1, 1, or 1, 2, or 2, 2, or whatever this our far right column is. I should still be able to generate a solution. And it doesn't matter if I have a 0 there or a 1 there. It doesn't matter. As long as I have a pivot position for every row, then this represents a transformation that's onto. All right, so what else can I say based on the fact that A is an invertible matrix? One other thing I can say is that there is at most one solution to AX equals B. And once again, why is that? Well, it's the same argument I made before. If I have this equation, and if I multiply both sides by that inverse, which I know exists, once again, my solution is A inverse B. But because I know that that inverse matrix is a unique matrix, then for any unique B, if I multiply by unique A inverse, I will get a unique solution. So this tells me that there is at most one solution to this matrix equation. But the fact that the transformation represented by matrix multiplication has at most one solution is also just the definition for a one-to-one -one transformation. So now we can characterize this transformation as one-to-one. -one. And so what other implications does this have? Well, if it has at most one solution to AX equals B for any B, well, what about this equation? AX equals the zero vector, the homogeneous equation. Well, we know it has at most one solution from that previous statement, but the homogeneous equation always has one solution. It always has a solution x equals zero. So because there can't be any more solutions, we know that the homogeneous equation 
has only the trivial solution. So that's another statement we can make. Now the fact that once again this transformation is 1 to 1 also tells us something else about the columns of the matrix A. It tells us that the columns of A are linearly independent. And this can really be seen in the previous statement that the homogeneous equation is only a trivial solution. Because if I look at that left hand side of that equation, once again if I think of that matrix vector multiplication as taking a linear combination of the columns of A, so in other words I can write that left hand side as x1 times that first column plus x2 times that second column, so on and so forth to the nth term here. So this is a restatement of that homogeneous equation, but I know it only has the trivial solution. So that says that there's only the trivial solution of this vector equation is zero. So that says the only solution to the vector equation is zero, and that's the definition of linearly independent vectors. So let's keep going. What else can we say? Well, if this is one to one, which means there's at most one solution to ax equals b, one result of that, if we think of the systems, is that there, there are no free variables. If I had solutions, and I represented those in terms of free variables, there would have to be multiple solutions because those free variables would be free to take any other value, unless there'd be infinitely many solutions. So if to have at most one solution, I can't have any free variables. But if I have a matrix and I wanted to identify which variables are the free variables, I would look for columns without pivot positions. So the fact that there are no free variables tells me that there must be a pivot position for every column of our matrix. All right, so I've been able to make all these statements just based on the fact that A is invertible. And it turns out that any one of these statements implies all the rest are true. So now I can see that if A is an invertible matrix, then that transformation representing the matrix multiplication is onto and one to one, and I've reminded myself of all these other properties that come about because of those definitions. Now what about the fact that it satisfies both of these conditions? That actually tells us extra content as well. For instance, if A is an n by n, and if it's onto and one to one, then it has a pivot position in every row and every column. That means that if I take A and I row reduce it, a must reduce, reduce to a special matrix. It must reduce to the identity matrix. So we can see that's true just from the fact that it has to have a pivot position in every row and every column. Now we've seen this giant relationship, all these true statements that we're just generating from the fact that A is invertible. And to summarize all them, we have the invertible matrix theorem. And it's really just a statement of all these equivalences. It says that given some A n by n matrix, the following statements are all equivalent, which means if one are true, they are all true. If one is false, they are all false. And what it really does is separate the set of all possible n by n matrices into two groups, singular matrices which are not invertible and non-singular matrices which are invertible. And so these statements really categorize both groups. Because if one of these is true, they are all true, and then we are in the group of invertible matrices. But if one of them is false, then they are all false, and we are clearly in the group of non-invertible matrices. So we've already talked about most of these. We start off said if A is invertible, then all the rest of these must be true. And now we've seen why that makes A row equivalent to the identity matrix. We've seen that it also must have n pivot positions, because it must have a pivot position for every row and column, and if A is n by n, that's how many columns it has. We've also seen the equation, the homogeneous equation, has only the trivial solution. We've talked about how the columns must be linearly independent. We've talked about how the transformation is one to one. We've talked about how the equation AX equals B has at least one solution for each B in RN. That was essentially the definition of onto. We've talked about how the columns of A span RN, another restatement of the fact that it's onto. We've said that it was absolutely onto. And these next two are just really restating that definition of an invertible matrix. So it says that if A is invertible, then there must exist, and this backwards is my is there exist statement again, there must exist some matrix such that C times A is equal to identity. And there also must exist some matrix such that D, oh, I think I have this in the wrong order. There must also exist some matrix D such that A times D equals identity. In fact, we can show that C and D are both the same matrix, that C is equal to D is equal to A inverse.
And the last one says that A transpose is also invertible. And that's once again just another property of invertible matrices, that A transpose does have an inverse, and that inverse is actually equal to the transpose of A inverse. So we've really been able to walk through all these different statements and tie back all our, our knowledge from previous sections, talking about what it means for matrices to be one-to-one -one and onto, and now we relate that to the fact that it's invertible or not invertible. So let's look at a quick example. So now we have all these relationships. Let's apply this theorem to these two matrices. So we start off with this first matrix, and we do a little investigation. I look at that matrix A, and right away I can see that I am in REF, so I can identify my pivot positions. I see that I have a pivot position for every column. That's one of the statements from my invertible matrix theorem. Since that statement is true, I know all the rest of those statements are true. I know that there exists an inverse to this matrix. I know this matrix is invertible. I know if I row reduce it, I'm going to get to identity. I know all those things because I've identified one of those statements as true. Now I look at the next one. For this matrix, I could do a lot of things to investigate this, but the first thing I see is that I have these two columns, column one and column three, and they look like they're just multiples of each other. That tells me these columns are not linearly independent. Well, that's saying that one of those statements from my invertible theorem was false. If one of them is false, they are all false. So I know that all those statements are false. This matrix does not have an inverse. I will not be able to find an inverse. I know I can also, if I row reduce it, I will not get to identity. I know all those other statements are false now because I've taken one false statement that I was able to, to view. If we actually do the row reduction, we can just confirm this. Uh, at least one of the other statements is also false. So if I start to do the row reduction, in this case, I'll take R3 minus R1. I'll just quickly write this out. I will get 0 here. I will get 3 here and 0 here. My next step would be to take 1 half of R2, which would give me this matrix. And my next step would be to take R3 minus 3R2. And this would give me this matrix. So I can see a couple things here. One, I was not able to row reduce to identity. I knew I wouldn't because one of those statements was false. I can also see that I don't have a pivot position in every row or in every column. Once again, all of those, those items I expected uh, because my one statement of the fact that not all the columns were linearly independent was false. Therefore, all the rest of those statements must be false. All right, so that includes these two examples of just kind of talking through the different statements from the inverse matrix theorem. And that concludes this video. Thank you very much.